very significant day in the time of protest. This is speaking for, not against. We're speaking for the Nuremberg Tribunal statements that crimes against humanity must be acknowledged and must be punished. And we certainly will not be a party to that any longer. Having been in Germany in 1945 and <coughs> seen in Belsen concentration camps the results of the Nazi atrocities there because not enough of the good German people spoke out against it, we will not permit that to happen again. And in the spirit of the prophets of past, of Jesus, of Buddha, of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the anti-Vietnam War resistance, now it is time that we must not just speak out against these things, but we must be willing to wage peace with our lives. Because there are lives, as has been mentioned, that are going to be lost when these trains pass over these tracks and are allowed to send munitions to kill innocent women and children in El Salvador, in Guatemala, and in Nicaragua. So it's a privilege to be here today. September 1st last year was the beginning of a fast on the steps of the Capitol, and today two of those veterans are on the steps of the Capitol, beginning of a fast there. Now we on the West Coast have the opportunity of also making a statement by sitting on these tracks and waiting for the day when war will be no more. What is that today will begin a, a new era of sustained resistance, like the Salt March in India, like the Civil Rights Movement in the 50s and 60s, where people every day realize that we the people are the ones that are going to make peace. Peacemaking is full time. War making is full time. And so my hope is that we will establish or create a kind of action here that revives the imagery of the sustained resistance of the past, such as in the Salt March and the Civil Rights Movements, where people are committed every day to say, as long as these trains move munitions on these tracks, we will be here to stop the train. Because each train that goes by here with munitions that gets by us is going to kill people, people like you and me. The question that I have to ask on the track is, am I any more valuable than those people? If I say no, then I have to say, you can't move these munitions without moving my body or destroying my body. And so today I feel a from the spirit of a year ago on the steps, and then for five months into Central America and coming back to the Nuremberg actions and today to begin this fast for atonement for all the blood that we have on our hands and that I have on my hands, and to envision a kind of resistance, an empowering kind of uh, spirit that we hope to participate with many people to say, these munitions will not be exploded in our names, and they will not be moved any longer in our names, and we must put our bodies in front of them to say, stronger than ever, that this will not continue in our name. The killing must stop, and I have to do everything in my power to stop it. And I hope that when people ask us what they can do to support us, what they can do is they can come to the tracks, stand with us on the tracks to stop the trains. That's all we want. We want more people join hands and say, this will not continue, and only we the people can stop. We hear that 63,000 people, most of them civilians, have been killed in El Salvador. We know that tens of thousands of people have been killed in the Contra War, directed and supported and financed by our own government. We know that the United States has built 11 major military installations in Honduras to continue that war. And we know that over 100,000 people in that region have been killed during the Reagan administration there. 
But we also know that we need to plunge below the surface of these statistics and understand them. The Pledge of Resistance obtained through the Freedom of Information Act documents that showed some of the weapons that came along these rails and along these roads were put on ships and went through the Golden Gate to Central America. We know that on only one shipment, there were 1,700 general demolition bombs. We know that there were 4 million rounds of ammunition that are used on helicopter gunships. And we know that on that particular shipment, there were 2,800 white phosphorus rockets. And we know what white phosphorus does. It gets on the skin and continues to burn. It's hotter than napalm. It's an improved form of napalm. We've sent that to Central America, and the people there have had to live with the consequences of those weapons. When people stand on these tracks, what they are doing is saying the war is not simply 3,000 miles away, that in a very real sense, the war is here. This is the war. It proceeds from just inside that gate in the hundreds of bunkers that honeycomb the fields here, filled with thousands of tons of weapons, and proceeds here by having people walk onto these tracks. They are, in a sense, standing in the way of the war. They are, in fact, breaking the rules of war. In this time of great destruction in Central America and the barreling arms race, it is up to ordinary citizens like us to get in our cars and drive to the war here and to stop the war here. It takes a great deal of love and courage and vulnerability, uh, vulnerability and compassion to do that because what you are saying very clearly, not only to your wider society, but to yourself, is that we are responsible for the fact that the war begins a few miles from where we live. And then sitting here long enough, we realize that in some ways the war begins in our hearts. Over the next 40 days, we are going to see people come from around the Bay Area and the Western United States to this place to interrupt that war, to join with our sisters and brothers in Central America, hold hands with them and say, as long as those weapons pass, we are here and we are standing with you. We join you in that risk and that vulnerability. Are we gonna miss the train? Well, you wanna take it over? I'll take it over. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Change the position in a minute. I don't want to miss the train. <laughs> Right here. I'm holding your leg, honey. Or, 
I'm, I'm holding the bleeding. Let me hold that. Well, Brian Wilson, we won't forget what you gave for us today. In peaceful disobedience of the American way. <laughs> They tried to stop that gun train, so down on the tracks you lay. And Brother Brian, they took your legs. What a price to pay. We saw you on the TV screen. The whole world heard your silent scream. Well, it must have felt like That's where you learn pain. And I remembered all the things you've done to bring an end to war. You were a frontline troop. You see. So Brian Wilson, we won't forget what you gave for us today. In peaceful disobedience of the American way. They tried to stop that gun train, so down on the tracks you lay. Brother Brian, they took your legs. What a price to pay. And your fasting days in Washington. Charlie and the rest You reached out to all us citizens And we share your quest Down in Central America You've seen the Holocaust Oh yes you did You went and looked into What you gave for us today The peaceful disobedience Of the American way You tried to stop that gun train So down on the tracks you lay And Brother Brian, they took your legs What a price to pay so I want to thank you all on behalf of all the barefoot and shirtless people all over the earth, and on behalf of Brian for being here today, thank you all for coming. I think it's too bad that it takes such violence uh, to get us all out here, but maybe we can change that. Maybe we can get thousands and thousands and thousands of North Americans out here at the Concord Naval Weapons Station and at every weapons depot in this country without any more violence. Let's stop the violence. <laughs> Since the very beginning of the Nuremberg actions, which Brian and myself and everybody who's organized this event have been involved in since May, and since the first day we were out here on June 10th, we have all had an agreement which we have upheld. And that agreement, well, there's been lots of agreements, and they're all within guidelines of nonviolence. But one of our nonviolent guidelines that we have all stuck to is not to be on the train tracks at all whenever a train is approaching. There was a claim in the Chronicle this morning that the drivers of the train felt justified for running Brian over because all summer we have been on the tracks and we have moved out of the way of the trains. This is not true. Whenever we have known a train is coming on this site, we have made sure that nobody is on the track, that everybody is at least three or four feet away from those rails because we knew that when it was that we were going to tell the weapon station that anybody would sit on the tracks we were serious, and that whoever sat on those tracks wasn't going to move. 
I want to I want to talk a little bit about the Nuremberg Charter and the Nuremberg Principle in case some of you don't know what this is all about and what Nuremberg actions are. The Nuremberg Charter that was signed after World War II uh, was signed by this country, the United States of America, as well as other countries, stating because of the atrocities that happened under Hitler's rule, because of the genocide, stating that it is a citizen's duty in whatever country that they live in, if their country is committing crimes against humanity, that the citizens of that country do everything possible to stop their government from committing that crime. This is international law. This is what we're doing here. We are upholding the law. We are upholding the law of God. Thou shalt not kill. Brian and I walked with the Veterans Peace Action Team 79 miles, or maybe it was 73, through the war zones of Northern Hinotega and Nicaragua. We walked through five battles, two mortar shellings. We interviewed countless victims of the landmines. I can't tell you how many hundreds of amputees Brian and I have been with. And how ironic when we were so prepared, both of us, for the possible risk of losing our legs on those roads because of our United States finance financed landmines. How ironic that Brian would lose his legs here on his own soil. When that train rolled over Brian, it rolled over all of us. And let us not forget, 45 years ago, if some Brian Wilson had given his legs on the train track, six million lives perhaps could have been saved. Somebody had to lay on the railroad track to stop the death trains from killing people in Germany or in Nicaragua. Let's stop the death trains from rolling. I come to you today with Holly and Miller O'Brien's family, as a concerned citizen, as a moral leader, in the spirit of Gandhi and Dr. King and Brian Wilson, people who acted out of conscience to protest the immorality of a war in Central America, a war that is neither moral, nor political, nor geopolitical. It is insane and it must end. <laughs> for those who really love America today, for those who are real true patriots today, our hero is not the North going south, it's Brian Wilson. That's a real hero. Our heroes are not those who act by night, illegally, immorally, in clandestine ways. Those who stand for conscience and do what's right, they represent the highest and best in our nation. This is an historic return today. Two centuries ago, Americans gathered at Concord risking life and limb for freedom and independence. 200 years ago, they resisted superpower terrorism, occupation, invasion. We return to Concord again today, Concord West, as opposed to Concord East. Again, we the people want freedom 
from terrorism and invasion and occupation. We want self-determination and self-respect. We're not a just being against terrorism. We're against terrorism everywhere for all the people. We don't want terrorism anywhere for any of the people. America to you and your family. These bombs and these weapons that move down this road and over these tracks are killing innocent people. Peasants. Peasants. Poor, innocent farmers. It's capitalism you're upholding. It's capitalism. It's not democracy. It's blatant capitalism. <laughs> Study war. 
move that train. You can move that train. You can move that train without moving our body. Sing it again now. You can move that train. No, you can move that train. You can move that train without moving our bodies. Keep on singing now. You can move that train. You can move that train. You can move that train without moving our bodies. One more time now. You can move that train. You can. without moving our body. Wherever I go in the United States, I find people who are experiencing a dramatic shift in their own paradigm. They know that what's happening is terribly wrong. They know what's happening in the United States. And in some sense, are beginning, I think, to recognize that perhaps the solution is not in our traditional political structures and institutions, but within us, within each of us, within you and within me. And that we are going to wage peace whether our governments want it or not, because we want peace more than anything else. Peace with justice. There is no peace without justice. And I have to really commend all of you people who have been carrying this vigil at the tracks through the cold and the rain. So I really do appreciate those of you who have been hanging in um, at the Concord Naval Weapons Station through this winter uh, weather. It gives me a lot of uh, inspiration and hope that we can sustain our selves in various places with Concord perhaps being a model uh, in the United States at a number of strategic locations, which is what we're talking about now with the Pledge of Resistance and Witness for Peace, to do the same thing or similar things that's happening in Concord, where we have a sustained presence day after day after day to say no to the death trains and the death trucks and the death policies of the United States. People ask me all the time, still, maybe not most of you, but when I meet people anew, and certainly in the media, why didn't I get off the tracks? And I have to keep reminding myself that those trains and trucks, I know you don't have to remind yourself who are seeing them every day, but I still have to remind myself, well, Every one of those trucks and trains is carrying bombs and rockets and ammunition that's going to kill people. And we are not worth more than the people who are going to be killed and maimed, and they are not worth less. And so, just like you, I sat on the tracks because the people who are going to be killed by the munitions on that train are worth just as much as I am. And so at least I want my government to have to remove my body if it wants to move that train. That's a, at least I can do. I just, I just share that with you because I still reflect on that every day. We all have a track, whatever our principles are, and we all have a train, something that represents an invasion of our dignity, a violation of our soul that's happening in the world that we need to stand up to. And I feel really fortunate that I can do it with you people and that we can do it with lots of other people in this country and that we can do it with lots of people in the world. The first principle, any person who commits an act which constitutes a crime under international law is responsible, therefore, and liable to punishment. The second principle, the fact that internal law does not impose a penalty for an act which constitutes a crime under international law does not relieve the person who committed the act from responsibility under international law. So the first point, 
I believe that some officials in our government are committing crimes against international law because of the violation of the Organization of American States Treaty, the Rio Pact, the United Nations Charter, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, the Geneva Convention, and, as I mentioned, some other U.S. laws, so, such as conspiracy to commit murder. So, okay, so then the, the third principle states, the fact that a person who committed an act which constitutes a crime under international law acted as head of state or a responsible government official does not relieve him from responsibility under international law. And that's fairly clear. I'll go on to principle four. The fact that a person acted pursuant to an order of his government or of a superior does not relieve him from responsibility under international law, provided that a moral choice was in fact possible to him. Now this is a very important principle. As, as you may know, and as I've studied, these principles were formed at the end of World War II because of all the crimes of the Nazi government. And they were also applied to the Japanese government. The, many of those things that were done under the Nazi regime were legal and terrible. And there was the United States and Britain, France, and the Soviet Union that led the way into developing these principles so that this wouldn't happen anymore. Now, this, so if the government is doing it, it still can be a crime. Now, the important point here, another important point, is provided that a moral choice was in fact possible. And I believe, like Socrates, I guess, that everyone is doing the best they can with what they know. I don't believe that people are malicious. I believe that people are trying to do the right thing. But they just don't know anything so many times. And as an educator, as a teacher and a writer, and as a speaker, a peace activist, I am attempting to help people understand. I'm attempting to give people a moral choice. But it's very difficult in our society. They say we have a free society. We do, but it's, if you don't have money, it's hard to get a book published. If, you're, if your ideas aren't popular, it's more difficult. And the people who are interested or like those ideas already are the people who are listen. I'm sorry. The people who like those ideas already are the people who listen. So, we have to do something because it's a very serious situation. Principle five, any person charged with a crime under international law has the right to a fair trial on the facts of law. Well, that's, I think, a very good point. And I believe in the judicial process. I believe in the jury system. And I'm not trying to do something vindictive or mean or punishment to any of these people that I feel are doing these crimes. I'm not saying, I'm going to go hurt you or do this to you because you're committing crimes. I'm just trying to point it out to people that it's happening. I'm not trying to inflict any punishment whatsoever. I'm just simply trying to make people aware of it. Principle six, the crimes here and after set out are punishable as crimes under international law. A, crimes against peace. It has two parts. The first part, planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression, or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances. I think this is particularly pertinent to the situation with the Contras. The second part of Crimes Against Peace states, participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of any of the acts mentioned under one. So you don't have to do the war all by yourself. If you're part of this large conspiracy, which is involved in promoting a war against another country, then, then you're part of the crime. B, war crime violations of the laws or customs of war which include but are not limited to murder 
ill treatment or deportation to slave labor or for any other purpose of civilian population of or in occupied territory, murder or ill treatment of prisoners of war or persons on the seas, killing of hostages, plunder of public or private property, wanton destruction of cities, towns, or villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity. And in my belief, many of these things are going on in El Salvador. Where many of the people who are living out in the villages are being bombed, and where mines are being placed, and people will get their legs blown off. Innocent women and children. C, crimes against humanity. Murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhuman acts done against any civilian population, or persecutions on political, racial, or religious grounds, when such persecutions are done or such persecutions are carried on in execution of or in connection with any crime against peace or any war crime. And these also are going on to a great extent with the Contras and in El Salvador and other places which the United States is, is supporting. And the final Nuremberg principle is number seven, which states that complicity in the commission of a crime against peace, a war crime, or a crime against humanity, as set forth in principle six, is a crime under international law. There's other jobs you can have. Don't be a part of this. Don't be complicit. Claymore mines are exposed as being. What an atrocity. What an atrocity that we develop landmines that blow off the bottom parts of people's legs and leave them to live maimed for the rest of their lives. You know, I know what it's like to be with someone that's maimed for the rest of their lives. It's not easy. It rips all of us off. <laughs> Our tax dollars. Not mine. I won't pay a penny. I won't pay a penny until this ends. Not one cent. I would rather spend the rest of my life in jail and pay for this. Because it's, the blood is on my hands if I pay for it. Explosives A. What's that? Martin Luther King said the bombs that explode in Vietnam exploding our cities too. The well, money and the resources wasted that, to kill people in happened, Central America. If something happened, if that was derailed, this whole town would blow up and all these people would die. We we're in danger right here. And what is the Protestant spirit, if not the spirit of protest? Now, true protest is not a negative thing. The word protest, the word Protestant, comes from the Latin protestare, meaning to testify for, to witness for, to speak up for. And for what? Here, for life, for the saving of life. And what more direct way to save lives than by standing on these tracks in the way of munitions trucks and trains, these tracks destined to destroy life. That's what protest is all about here at the tracks and why we Protestants belong here. Not that this protest action came about by a lot of religious folk like us coming here and sanctifying these tracks with prayers and with hymns and with crosses. No, it was the other way around. A piece of railroad track was sanctified by the mutilated body and blood of one of us. And then, when that happened, a community formed, a community gathered to sing hymns, to pray, and to carry crosses right here on the tracks. 
But those of us who have been in war can never forget it. We've tried, didn't work. Many of us have been in denial for a long time. We had to be prepared to endure the process, painful as it is, to be healed. To reconcile ourselves to what we did, to share that with our culture, because all of us are complicit in these wars, whether we like to admit it or not. We can be opposed to the policies, but we live in a culture with one twentieth of the world's population. We're in the minority, consuming one half the world's resources. Something's got to give when there's that kind of a formula. Somebody and some things have to go without. And when we do that, we have to be in denial because we then are doing things that are completely at odds with the truth, the dignity and integrity of other people, and the very fundamental natural resources upon which we live in this planet. So we have to be prepared, I think, to ask the fundamental question now for the next few years, what price are we willing to pay for peace? How much do we want peace? Which means how much are we willing to live justice? How badly do we want it? If we want it badly enough, if we want it as much as we want our possessions, if we want it as much as we want our careers, we can have it. But we've got to be prepared to live it. We've got to be prepared to pay the price, take the risks, make the sacrifices. But you'll be free when you're prepared to do that. You will have an incredible liberation within yourself, a calm, a peace, peace of mind, peace of heart, peace with your neighbors. You can take the cat calls because you don't have to react anymore with hostility. It's nonviolence. It means becoming at peace with yourself, offering an alternative of love, if you will, of help of harmony, a non-retaliatory attitude, no matter what happens. And it's a struggle. In my opinion, you can't stop the violence of our culture with violence. I believe that in the first world, especially in the United States, we need a non-violent revolution of consciousness that's prepared to non-cooperate and resist while always offering an alternative attitude and lifestyle and work style, be prepared to non-cooperate. Withdraw our consent. The people in Washington, who we call our political leaders, really are simply our employees who have become lawless. But we've allowed them to be lawless. We have given them their power, and we now need to take it back. The only real power is with the people. The people in Washington simply are a product of a long process of trying to manage collective affairs of a society. They do not have the right to murder people. They don't have the right to build weapons to murder people. We pay them. And however you want to look at it, we are complicit in these policies and our challenge is to extricate ourselves from this complicity, as we, I think, are doing. What do you do? You need to walk through that very conspicuous hole in the fence over there. And you can write it. I wonder if you can do it. The denial runs so deep. What do you call this facility? We call it the nuclear bunker. What do you call it? Oh, excuse me. Do you even have a name for it? There's a saying, the Navy neither confirms nor denies. That's a lie. They deny it with every breath. And yet they can't deny it. They can't let us walk in, clearly. So I've been thinking a lot over the last couple of years what I'm going to do with my life. And what that thinking has led me to do is to put my life on the line. Live here as a constant reminder on the line. Today I've come to leave a reminder. This is my blood.
In my home church, my priest was killed for miembros de paramilitares by the death squads, paramilitary death squads. Desde marzo de este año de las elecciones, and from March this year, the elections, hay más violaciones de derechos humanos. The violations of human rights has increased. Los escuadrones de la muerte actúan de día y de noche. The death squads are acting day and night. Todo esto con el con el apoyo de este país. And that is only happening with the support from this country. Con todas estas armas que están destruyendo miles de niños. These weapons that are killing thousands of children. ¿Cuántos de nosotros tenemos hijos? How many of us have children here? ¿Cuántos de nosotros realmente? How many of us really? Sentimos como humanos. Feel as brother as human beings. La muerte de estas criaturas que están comiendo hojas. The deaths of these children. And these children that are dying in malnutrition. We, we are all brothers and sisters, and why should we be sending these weapons to kill these people? And their voice isn't really heard. A lot of people don't know what's happening down there. They don't know that there is a lot of killing. Thousands of people are being killed and a lot of them are children. And there's landmines that are blowing people's legs off. There's hundreds, 900 children in Nicaragua on amputees. And uh, these, these people, I just, I just wonder why we have to be killing them. On September 28th, I don't know, why did you sit on the tracks? I didn't want any more weapons to be. And you knew it was against the law to, to sit and block the train? No. You didn't know that? It's not against the law to block weapons or kill people. In fact, matters you intended to sit on the train track as it was trying to come through. As the train was trying to come through? Yes. yes. And you knew that it was wrong to do so? No, it wasn't wrong to do so. You knew it was wrong to do so? It was not wrong to do so. Under international law, it is illegal to ship those arms to Central America. Okay, Your Honor. I specifically related my experience as a, as a physician uh, to 10,000 civilians uh, in an area that was bombed or rocketed or strafed daily by U.S. supplied aircraft and the effects of weapons like white phosphorus, uh, gatling guns that put a bullet in every square foot of a football field every 60 seconds, or fuse extenders that cause bombs to explode in the air rather than the craters and their destructive effect on the villages that were categorized by the commander of the Salvadoran Air Force as a free fire zone, meaning anyone was a, was a legitimate target. And I uh, was specifically trying to help them understand that these kind of tactics uh, don't win the hearts and minds of the very people whom allegedly were, were in the region to, to assist. Were these civilians that you treated in El Salvador? Ninety-five percent of my work was with civilians in accordance with the uh, medical neutrality provisions of the Geneva Conventions. On occasion, I would treat uh, military soldiers. On occasion, to treat guerrillas. But the substance of my work was largely civilians. And the civilians you testified were injured by these uh, white phosphorus rockets and bombs. That's correct. Were, was that an accident? Uh, well, um, the uh, the uh, first time I testified in Congress, I merely stated uh, what I had observed that this area that made up some 16 villages uh, was bombed or rocketed or strafed almost daily on an indiscriminate basis. Uh, a number of members of Congress whom I presented that briefing then uh, went to El Salvador and asked Colonel Bustillo, the commander of the Salvador Air Force, uh, about my allegations. And his response was, of course, that's a free fire zone. Uh, 
Uh, that's a military term that means anything is a legitimate target, meaning it be 16 clinics of the 30 schools or, or uh, two hospitals or, or a legitimate target. Uh, so the specific civilians were, were uh, you know, a pilot flying a uh, plane can't pick out a specific civilian per se, but certainly it was purposeful in terms of what was done to that area. And uh, by 1986, the Salvador military finally boasted that that area had been pacified meaning that all 10,000 civilians had, had fled, had been captured, had been killed, or uh, otherwise disappeared. The company of a weapons station is a major target for a nuclear attack on the West Coast. Also, during the Vietnam War, 80% of the weapons that went to Vietnam came through the company of a weapons station. I remember really being moved by something Brian Wilson said before, and that um, that is that these people are our brothers and sisters, and my life is not worth more, and theirs is not worth less. And and that was really going through my, my mind the whole time that I was sitting on the track. During three years, that was my routine. The week of the 12th of January of 1981, I will not forget again, I repeat this expression, the number 97, because in that week, I recognized from Monday to Friday, 97 corpses, 97 people who were killed again with weapons of heavy caliber. In all of the cases, men in civilian clothes, clothes have come to different houses to take these people out and mercilessly kill them. And that was my routine. And well, then the duties of the Justice of the Peace is to investigate who the criminals were, who the authors of the crimes were. And it was obvious that the authors were the death squads related to the Salvadoran army. I said that it was obvious because in those days, El Salvador was living what we call martial law. From six o'clock in the afternoon till six o'clock in the morning, nobody was able to go out in the street unless you know the, the ways, I mean the codes that they use in cars uh, to be freely walking in the streets. That is why Everybody knew who the killers were. And, you know, I knew who the killers were also. But when you are living in a country like El Salvador, even though you are, a, you're, according to the law, you are an authority and you have all the rights, and not just the right, but the obligations to go forward in the investigation, if you go one step ahead, you may be next. That was why uh, to be tranquil with my consciousness, I started surreptitiously to cooperate with the Human Rights Commission of El Salvador, the unofficial, the non-governmental Human Rights Commission, passing through information. I knew that that was a very risky job, but at least these people who were killed had a voice so that the world know what was going on in that particular area of the Salvador in some kind. I can tell you very frankly, and I'll volunteer this to you, that uh, the more I learned about the conduct of the United States policy under this administration in Central America, the harder I work to change that policy, because I personally regard it as a very wrong-headed policy, which has caused a great deal of death and destruction in that region, and great injury to people, not only there, but here, but in Contra Costa County, and is also, in my opinion, and I think I've explained sufficient of my background to tell you that my opinion, I believe, is an informed one, very much against the long-term interests of the United States. Did the United States, to your knowledge, have notice that it 
was violating the International Court of Justice ruling? Absolutely. The International Court of Justice said no aid and support for the Contras. And the United States went ahead and aided and supported the Contras. Um, in part, other U.S. violations are because El Salvador is engaged in violations of the rules of armed conflict. El Salvador carries out its armed conflict primarily against the civilian population. This is discernible by obvious casualty counts, admitted casualty counts. And in discussions I've had with high government officials, including military commanders in charge of overall military operations, presidents of the country, and the minister of the presidency of El Salvador, they admit that they target people who are correctly characterized as civilians. They attempt to justify it by using the term masas, M-A-S-A-S, -A -S, and call people who sympathize with the dissidents, who they call subversives, the masas, which in their mind equals enemy. Therefore, they can target them as a legitimate military target. I Why disagree with this? their characterization. Mm -hmm. What made you to believe that they target the masses? Because they told me. Who told you? Adolfo Rey Prendes in April, May of 1985 was um, very adamant about that point in a meeting I had with him. He stated that they're the enemy because they're the masses. They, he said, they support the subversivos, he calls them subversive. They support the subversives. They're the enemy. And in also discussing the implication of the air war, air war per se is not a violation. But air war targeted, targeted at civilian targets is. It's a violation to attack the civilian population with any bare hands, a match to the A-bomb. The civilian population may not be the target of war. The Salvadorian <coughs> government has admitted to me that they attack people that they call masses. Those people are civilians. I've always been civilians and in no way are characterizable as combatants. In discussing the air war, Ray Prendis told me that without the air war, they could not have any military edge. Without the air war, they would lose. So they are admitting to me, that's an admission, a violation of the Geneva Convention. Because it's an admission of a war crime? Yes. And uh, Ray Prendis is who? At the time he made that statement, he was the minister of the presidency, that second in charge after President Duarte. Torture exists in the Salvadorian army, that people in the Salvadorian army engage in torture. He tried to disclaim responsibility by saying the people that did it were out of control and were aligned to the far right. The government is charged with torture if any of its agents, regardless of political affiliation, engage in actions in contravention of the Geneva Conventions. And as you know, torture, attacks on the civilian population are all identified in those great breaches in the great breach articles of the Geneva Convention. General Garcia admitted torture, using the word torture. This tribunal isn't asked to try an official of the United States government for a violation of international law. This court is asked to allow those principles to be part of the defense of private citizens who attempted to find a forum where their right to respect the rule of law 
Good. What was your intention in sitting on the track? My intention was to take a firmer stance and saying, no, we can't continue this. It's not only killing people in Central America, but it's destroying our society as well. Um, it was to do, I mean, like I had this sense when I was a little kid, like you hear about something that's awfully wrong and you just stamp your foot down and say, well, no, I was there. I wouldn't let it happen. You know, like hearing about Nazi Germany where some of my father's relatives had been killed in the Holocaust, um, you know, just the sense of, well, if I was there, that couldn't happen. And so it was just, all right, well, I'm here. The time, this is now the wrong that's being done. I'm going to put myself on the tracks and do what I can do to say no. Uh, I thought of standing on a rooftop and screaming out, you know, for God's sake, stop what you're doing. You're killing innocent women and children. <laughs> so I thought, if I risk the rest, maybe somehow I can get the message out to the people and, and to Congress. Somehow, I, I, I didn't know what else to do. This country that I love so much was this country that I love so much was doing things that we accused the Nazis of doing. Women and children and non-combatants were being killed. And I couldn't think of any way to stop this. So I said, maybe, maybe if the world sees that someone that loves this country as much as I do. was willing to risk arrest and willing to go to jail. Maybe then somebody will listen. Mr. Well, um, uh, when a train was coming from the tidal area to the inland area, uh, did those trains carry weapons? Almost always. How do you know that? Um, I'm assuming that they wouldn't be marked with explosive signs unless they were carrying explosives. Well, if you're concerned about Central America, why are you? Why did you or other people sit on the tracks if the train was going into the inland area? The whole operation of the base is under question uh, in my mind. If I believe that that crimes are being committed, um, I believe that. that Operations can't go on. And um, was there anything about the incident on September 1st that affected you in, in, in why you stayed with the tracks? Brian Wilson um, was run over by the train, and that was, uh, that was, that affected me very strongly. And that, <coughs> made me realize that the, the tracks at Concord Naval Weapon Station are, are the um, place where there's the most intense resistance to the war in Central America. And also, it, it confirmed what Brian had said to me, that the World Peace Force would start at the tracks. So I just decided to stay out at the tracks. So I decided to pray and to appeal directly to God, and to live my life as a prayer, because that is the most that I can do, that I can see now. Short of turning to, I suppose, some could be prompted to turn to violent insurrection, but I am not. I think that that would be a mistake, no matter if we were to win or lose. So I've chosen to make my life a prayer for peace, and to live that life in opposition to this these illegal policies on the tracks at home. Come on and tell the leaders of every land over and over make them understand military madness has gone to
too far in our world today there is no room for war 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 and we want peace on earth peace on earth peace on earth in our time Peace on earth, peace on earth in our time. Come on and tell the people of every land. Let's get together, the future's in our hands. United Nations, they must agree to say no to war and say yes to peace. And we want peace on earth, peace on earth. 